Good morning, ABC Kids. We're so glad that you guys are joining us today. I hope you've been following along with your memory verses with us each week. This week's memory verse is, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2.38 Now you probably noticed that this was the last week at your at-home church packet. We will have new packets available on Friday in the pickup box in front of the church. You could also download the packets online. Mr. Brian will be teaching us today. But first, let's stand for some worship. Have a great Sunday. I was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash, I am born again. Forever safe in the Savior's hands. You were more than my words could say. I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days. I'll fix my eyes, following your ways. Forever free in unending grace. Cause you are, you are, you are.
kids, thanks for joining us today. Today we are continuing in the book of Acts in the Bible's New Testament. Over the past several weeks, we've got to see how the Holy Spirit has been working in the life of the apostles. And today we are in chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. In this week's passage, we are seeing an exciting event of mass repentance. Repentance is our theme, and I'll come back to that shortly. Peter has been preaching to a large crowd that has been amazed at what the Holy Spirit is doing through the apostles, those first followers of Christ. And as we read in verse 37, it says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. So Peter is saying, repent and be baptized. And you know what? God is saying the same thing to us today. You see, we are all sinners and we need to repent. What is repentance, you might ask? It is changing our direction, turning from sin. You see, sin is pulling us in the wrong direction. It pulls us away from God. Whether it be the temptation to lie about why we didn't finish all the chores on our chore list or even to have a bad attitude about having to do chores in the first place. That was a problem when I was a kid. We naturally want to cover up and hide from our sin, but that draws us further from God and the forgiveness that he has for us. We need to own our sin and ask Jesus to cleanse us. Jesus is longing for us to release our sin to him and to accept the forgiveness that only he can provide. Repentance is how we accomplish that. You know what, with today being Father's Day, it makes me think as a father, what kind of example am I being to my children in the area of repentance? Am I showing them what forgiveness and repentance looks like in my life? And in fact, for all the parents watching, that's a great question for us to ask ourselves today, is what kind of example are we being to our kids as it comes to repentance and forgiveness? Are we showing God's love, especially in our interactions with our kids? And you know, as we go back to our passage, verse 41 says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow, 3,000 souls added to the kingdom through Peter's message. And it goes on to say that, that these new believers devoted themselves to the teaching of the word 
and the fellowship with other believers. In fact, they even sold their possessions and gave to the poor as was needed. And in verse 47, it says, They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the movement of God continued to grow and grow from there and kept growing to where it is today. So as we wrap up, I want us to remember that the same power of the Holy Spirit that was available in the book of Acts is available to us today. And that we should admit our sins to Jesus and he will forgive us. That's called repentance. You know, and our key question kids, as we ask ourselves this morning, is do we have any sin that we need to confess to Jesus and to tell him that we've done wrong? You know, let's pray about that right now. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much uh, just for your word and Lord for this book of Acts and and just the reminder of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives, Lord, and specifically today about repentance and Lord, how we need to turn from our sins and go to the forgiveness that you are so waiting to offer us, Lord. I just thank you so much for that offer, Lord, and for all that you do to forgive us if we would just turn to you. In your name I pray, amen. All right, bye kids. Have a great morning. What's up students? Thanks again for jumping in uh, to home church this morning. If you guys uh, missed last Tuesday, we started something called Youth Night Live from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's an incredible opportunity to come to the church, to be in small groups that are socially distanced, all spread out through campus, where we actually are live streaming messages, games, um, and a discussion uh, that you guys can actually jump into and interact with your friends and be pushed to look more like Jesus. This week, uh, we actually had a lot of fun. High school played a game called Quiplash where they sent in different answers that were like super creative and stuff to come up with a weekly challenge. Middle school though, their weekly challenge was to create the best balloon sculpture out of the resources that were provided. And gosh, I gotta say, there were some creative winners this week. Specifically this one a giant giraffe. They use the chairs, they use the table. Even if you see in the top right of that picture, there's actually like a little tongue sticking out of the giraffe. Um, We were just blown away with the cuteness of this thing and the creativity, which is why they actually won this week. So after the game, students, you guys are able to come in um, and actually watch a message given by Zach. And currently we're going through a series called Practicing the Way of Jesus. And essentially what that series is all about and what we're aiming to do is to look into the life of Jesus and the things that he did that weren't blatantly out in front of everyone to see. The way that Jesus practiced his quiet time, the way that Jesus spent time with his friends, the realness that we get to see with Jesus and the rawness that we get to see within him. And we look at those little bits of Jesus and we try to see how we can implement those bits into our life as well. And what we call those is spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits that we get to institute into our weekly rhythms. And so high schoolers, if you haven't been able to watch any of those videos or be a part of it, I encourage you guys to go back onto the um, student minist- or ABC Student Ministries YouTube channel, check it out and um, get caught up on those different discussions that we've been able to look at and talk through, um, but also able to meditate on and hopefully have a, a change in our own life. Especially the biggest point too, going into summer is we kind of have that option in front of us is we can kind of let summer waste away, maybe just kind of go through the motions of it, or we can come so engaged, so ready to seek um, different avenues of how to institute the life of Jesus into our own life as well. So high schoolers, we're praying for you guys. Middle schoolers, we're praying for you guys too and hoping that you guys can jump into these Tuesday night sessions with us um, and be part of this movement of God where we're actually allowing God to transform us on a daily basis so we can be empowered to change the world. We love you guys as students and we're so excited to see you guys this next Tuesday, again, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we hope to see you guys at Youth Night Live. Hold on to me as we go As we roll down this unfamiliar road
Good morning, ABC Church Online. My name is Ricky Reed. We have an awesome week coming up for you. I'm so stoked. We have our another worship night, June 28th, 7 p.m. It's going to be on campus this time. So make sure to bring your chairs so you have somewhere to sit. It's going to be awesome to see everybody. Just come and have a great time in worship. For those of you who haven't been connected to a home church yet, we have an awesome opportunity for you to watch the service on campus. It's going to be 8 a.m. in the sanctuary. It is limited to 100 people. So please call our number 805-466-2051 for more information. Why why do you have a drill, Josh? I got a drill because we're giving away $25 to Home Depot. You're right, because we asked you fathers to send in videos of your kids. We have three categories. What are they? They are most adorable, most hilarious, and of course, most likely to make the news. Ooh, all right, first up, check out this video, most adorable. That was so stinking cute. The next video submission we got is the most hilarious. Check it out right now. I'm dyeing my daughter's hair. And last week, she cut my hair because, you know, COVID, we can't go out. So she cut my hair and now I'm going to dye her hair. (laughs) It's kind of getting the hair that's going across. That's okay. It's all going to be dyed anyway. So. But you're going to have to turn. And I can't see. There you go. Oh, and this will be the last on this side. Okay. So if any of you kids out there want their hair dyed, don't call me. So just in case you're wondering what color we're doing, we're doing a beautiful blue periwinkle. on our hair. It's called periwinkle. Start, don't touch this part. But we're doing underneath first, Do it underneath right? first, yep. That's so okay. since this video shouldn't be too long, we're gonna kind of end the video right now so that uh, it can not be close. too long. Okay. Uh, of a video. Get, like, Thanks right for joining here. us today. This is Anna and Rob, mm-hmm. and there have a go. great day. And this one's the most likely to make the news. Check it out. Thank you guys so much for sending in those videos. That $25 gift card is going to get mailed to your house directly from us. Thank you guys for joining us online and have a super Super Sunday. Sunday. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place I believe you are the way The truth The life I believe you are the way The truth The life
and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. Yes, you do. All my fears and doubts, yeah, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. Yeah. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I
Father, we just look to you today. We ask that you would fill our hearts as we open your word. God, that we would receive your truth. That we would see that your spirit is with us. It's among us. It's in us. It's for us, God. And I just pray that you would just empower us to be changed by you. God, just speak to us today and just be with us, be with our families, be with our children, God, be with our loved ones, and just be glorified in all that we do today. We ask in your name. Amen. Welcome to ABC. It's great to have you with us today. I'd like to start off by saying Happy Father's Day. Hope you have a great day today, dads. And speaking of dads, uh, we uh, as a family have something that's coming up. Our daughter Stacy, who lives in Colorado, is about to deliver twins. And so we're kind of on call, could be leaving at any moment. So for the next few weeks, uh, don't know what our life is going to look like exactly. Although we have a pretty good idea because some of you who know us a little better might remember that a about seven years ago now, uh, our oldest daughter, Kimberly, also delivered twins. Uh, she had a little toddler named Noah and delivered twins. And our daughter, Stacy, has a little toddler named Luke and about to deliver twins. Had a lot of people ask, do twins uh, run in your family? To which I answer, you think? I, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if they run in our family or not. But I know this. I've got two daughters. And uh, they're, they're both are uh, having twins. And uh, we're going to add to the number of grand boys that we have. We'll, we'll be up to seven. And you might be asking, so how many granddaughters do you have? We have zero. So we have a lot of grand boys. Uh, and uh, we're excited, though. So, again, next few weeks, we're kind of going to be on call, kind of be away. And that's exciting news for us personally. So I just wanted to bring you up to date on that. Um, and I... When I walk in the mornings, I listen to podcasts, some of you probably too do as well, and uh, uh, Kerry Newhoff uh, is one of the ones that I really, really enjoy, and uh, he said something that I thought I might just share with you. He, at the end of one of the podcasts, said, how not to open a church or reopen a church after coronavirus, and I thought it might be helpful. Uh, so he, he listed seven uh, points. I'm going to list five of them for us this morning. Um, how not to open a church, okay? Uh, violate as many social distancing guidelines as possible. Uh, that's not the way to do it. And so just to be aware, you know, it's one thing to, to, to open a little church. It's another thing to open a large church like ours. We just need to be aware that there are some, some guidelines for distancing and all that. We need to be respectful of one another. Um, secondly, he says of how not to open a church, exercise your constitutional rights, but ignore your responsibilities. Uh, third, open so fast that you have to close again. Can I just say this? Uh, you know, we do not want to make national news for a church that opened too soon and that we have an outbreak and that we are the source of that as a church. That's not the way to make the news. Uh, that's not our, 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 our aspiration. So just, just kind of be aware of that. Um, uh, make it political. Uh, it's amazing. Everything is political today. And he says, you know, if you really want to blow it in terms of how to open a church, make it about politics. And uh, fifth is this. Uh, use social media to vent. Uh, yeah, let's just be really careful about the things that we say on social media and the responses and those kinds of things. I got to be honest with you. Um, you know, I've been called a coward or we've been called cowards more uh, in the last uh, several weeks than have in our entire lives. And uh, just on a personal note, uh, you may not want to be the next person that says that to me personally. I think probably if you're going to say it, Jake is probably the guy to say it to and not Tom. Just just saying, just <laughs> Just say it. But, you know, there's just stuff out there, you know. So just want to be sensitive and aware. And uh, we are moving through this season the best that we possibly can. With keeping some of these things in mind, uh, there's always more to the story, right? And we're trying to keep you as informed as possible along the way. So we would appreciate your patience and your prayers. But I thought Kerry Newhoff's uh, insights were really helpful and really, really, really great. Um, 
We are in a series in the book of Acts. I'm thrilled to be able to bring this message today from Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 through 47. There are passages of the scriptures that we gravitate towards as uh, speakers and communicators and preachers, and this is, happens to be one that I really do love. So I'm happy to have this today uh, to share with you. And, and I think the reason is because I've literally spent my uh, entire adult life um, involved in the church. Uh, God called me to ministry when I was uh, about 18, 19 years old, and, uh, and God gave me a love for the church, for the bride of Christ. And so when I read this passage of scripture, it's all about how to do church. It's basically kind of what I've spent my whole life doing, so I'm very passionate about it. Uh, it's not only how to do church, but also it includes some things like why do we do church, you know? Uh, church is God's idea. Uh, it, it is literally something that God has intended for us to be a part of. It is a family. Church is a family. It is the family of God. When you come to faith in Christ, God adopts you into his family. And as a result of that, we are brothers and sisters in Christ in the truest sense. And so when we talk about church, it's helpful to go back to the origination of the church to find out how did it start? How did they do it? How are we supposed to do it? It's kind of a good check for, for all of us. Uh, we Last week, we're in Acts chapter 2. Jeff did a phenomenal job talking uh, about Peter and that sermon as he stood up and, and uh, the response to the sermon. And, and you'll remember in verse 38, he said, repent, let, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ the forgi for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on in verse 40 to say, be saved from this perverse generation. Um, the church itself is born when Peter stands up and proclaims this message of salvation. And salvation comes how? Through repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the result of which is the forgiveness of sins. And what we're saved from is we are saved from this perverse generation. It is always God's plan and has always been God's plan to deliver his people and to save his people. And Peter makes this great proclamation and he says, repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Friends, that's always been the message of the church and that will always be the message of the church. And that is what we proclaim today as well. So that's the foundation of the church and 3,000 souls were added in that one day. And then it goes on in verse 42. Look what it says. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and they were sharing with all, as anyone might have need, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking the bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved." Boy, this account is packed full of so much helpful information for us, uh, especially as we look at the beginning of the church. And as we uh, are in our home churches now, we have over 40 home churches that are meeting, and, and you might be one of those people meeting in those churches. Super helpful. There's some practical things that will help you in your homes, in the home church, in our large church setting as well, some things to be reminded of. The most important things, here's what it is, verse 42, they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We begin with the apostles' teaching. Jesus, you know, when he gave the Great Commission, you'll remember what he said. He said, all authority has been given unto me on heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Is ex this is exactly what we saw take place in Acts chapter 2, right? That they were being baptized. They were repenting. They were being baptized. And now we move on in verse 20 from Jesus' commission and it says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. The apostles' teaching literally is doing what Jesus said we're supposed to do, and that is teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
See, that's what church is all about. Church is about taking the Word of God, proclaiming it to people, and explaining it to people. It's the process of making disciples, disciple-making. Uh, we are turning people to Jesus for the answers to the life issues uh, and the problems of their lives. Uh, people are looking for direction. People are looking for a sense of purpose. They're looking for answers, especially right now. And we have the opportunity to point them to Jesus. God's plan is to build this great church of his uh, through the teaching of the word of God. Therefore, the teaching of the word of God has to be our top priority, all right? First Peter chapter 2, verse 22, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. How do you grow? It's through the milk of the word of God. That's how you grow. That's how we grow. That's what the church is called to do. And so we do so in obedience to the commission and the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we observe in the book of Acts, the first church did as well. Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Secondly is fellowship. Notice what it says here, to fellowship. They were continually devoting themselves to what? To fellowship. God wants his people. God wants the church. God wants you to experience genuine fellowship. Fellowship is this caring about one another and caring for one another. Uh, the best definition that I've ever heard uh, that I still think of so many times. Uh, what does fellowship mean? It means fellows in the same ship. You know, it's literally we're in this boat together. And because we're in this boat together, we are to care for one another. We are to share with one another. We are to comfort one another. Uh, we are to do life together. Uh, the victories that we share and we rejoice in those victories and, and, you know, the setbacks of life that are so much a part of our lives that we have someone to share that with as well, uh, to commensurate with one another when we uh, experience those uh, challenges of life, to know that you're not doing it alone is an amazing thing. And so as we gather together, uh, regardless of where we are, whether it be in a large setting or a smaller setting, there is to be fellowship. Um, I, I love Philippians chapter two. Um, Philippians chapter two is is one of the one of the great great passages of scripture. I go to so many times in my own life, uh, and I usually start with verse three. Um, but let's start with verse one because the point here is this: that therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ. If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to this group of people. He says, you want to make me happy? You want to make God happy? Then, then you know, what, what you need is, is genuine fellowship, being of the same mind, same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, you know, and then he moves into that great passage in verse three, talking about humility, you know, regard one another as more important than yourself and all those principles that Jesus Christ demonstrated first and foremost himself. Uh, that's the role model for us. That's a role model for you. Uh, but there is this encouragement. There's this consolation. There's this fellowship. There's compassion, all of these things. It makes God happy when we're in genuine fellowship, and we need it. We desperately need it. Third is the breaking of bread. Of course, uh, this reference is to communion. Uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. We're well aware of it. It's a memorial, in a sense, to what Jesus Christ was about to do, and now for us, what Jesus Christ has done. Uh, the result of this was that the, the apostles continually taught the ordinances, which is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, we have started on Wednesday evenings, providing an opportunity in this unique season that we're in for, for communion to take place. Uh, and it's kind of a self-serve kind of thing that you come down here and, and all because it's so much a part of what we need. We want to be faithful to what God has called us to do. And so the, the breaking of bread communion is a part of that. 
But there was more to it in terms of than just communion because it had literally a double meaning. In essence, it was this, not just communion, but also the eating of meals together. In verse 46, and breaking bread from house to house, they were eating their meals with gladness uh, uh, as well. So we have this concept here of... um, uh, uh, of, of eating meals together as well. You know, if you were to ask a, a, a church, say a successful church from, from our perspective, you know, what are the ingredients to, to having a super successful church? I doubt that anyone would answer, you know, one of the, one of the great ingredients is communion and eating meals together. But the reality is, from God's vantage point and from the early church, that communion and eating Meals together was a very vital component of this growing, vibrant church that started with 3,000 people and they were adding people to their number daily. Um, I'd like to say it this way you know, God's workbench, <laughs> when God wants to work on his people, on his workbench, you know, when God puts us on the workbench to do his work in our lives, it's basically think of two tables. The communion table, where literally God does his surgery on us and our hearts and our souls. It's a time for reflection. It's time to slow down. It's a time to think. It's a time to to confess our sin. Uh, It's time to get right with God. That's what communion is all about. But you know, the other table is the kitchen table. God does some of his best work on us around the kitchen table. When we share a meal with others, when we share our lives with others, when we have casual conversations that point towards him, God's workbench is the communion table and the kitchen table. And I think it's important for us to remember that breaking of bread is a really vital ingredient. And and one of the great advantages to our, our home church is the opportunity for that. I would encourage you that you might include just some eating together, some snacks, some sharing. You know, I really believe that God is using this season to move us from the backyard to the front porch, back where our grandparents used to enjoy life, on the front porch with neighbors and and fellowship and, and interaction, that God is, in a sense, helping us to understand, our generation to understand, and my children's generation to understand how important the front porch is. And for a lot of us, you know, it's around the table. I would encourage you to think of creative ways in which you might integrate uh, the kitchen table into your life and your ministry and involvement with others. And of course, the fourth thing was prayer. God's church has always been called to prayer. And they were continually devoting themselves to prayer. The longer I'm in ministry, uh, the more I believe in the need for prayer. And the more we as a church uh, have prayed, to be honest. We, we continually pray. Our leaders pray. Our elders are praying elders. They do so on a continual basis. And the greatest example that we have of that is Jesus. Uh, let me just share some scriptures with you just to remind you again of the necessity of prayer, specifically in the life of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Matthew 19, 13, then little children were brought to Jesus, to him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. Isn't it amazing? that our Savior, you know, that people would recognize something about Jesus and they were literally bringing their kids to Jesus to pray. And what did Jesus do? He stopped. He took the time, laid hands upon them and prayed. By the way, just a side note, I, I always, when people ask for prayer, I always try to stop right then and pray. And I do so because of this, because of what I saw in the life of Jesus. I think that's what Jesus would do. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we should do. When somebody asks you to pray, would you consider stopping right then and and praying for them? In Mark chapter 11, verse 25, he says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sin. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that we, when we pray, it's a time as well to, to consider our relationship with others 
and, and forgive them as we have been forgiven. And then Luke chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying. Jesus continually prayed. We must continually pray. What our country needs right now, what we need more than anything, is Christians to stand up and pray. It is the cornerstone of the church. Verse 43 shows us that God will work, okay? And, and now everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. This word awe is translated uh, a reverential fear and wonder. Uh, there is this sense in which there's this reverence, there's this healthy fear, like unbelievably, uh, like God is working in this unbelievable way and, and it's awesome. And we use the word awesome all the time, right, for almost everything. This truly was awesome, the signs and the wonders. Now, what we need to remember here is that this was a brand new teaching, okay? The church was birthed, it was new. The messengers were considered to be ignorant men, you know, and, and so their credibility was very low. And we're going to see in weeks ahead, again, that's going to be restated again and again, that people were shocked that these untrained, ignorant men could, could have such a powerful message. It was astounding to people. It was one of the sense of awe that people had when they listened to Peter and others. And so what God needed to do with this new movement was to authenticate the message and specifically authenticate the messengers. And the way in which God authenticated the message to prove that the gospel was real was by performing these signs and wonders. So these signs and wonders came as the church was established. I have people who, through the years, ask the questions, why don't we see the signs and wonders now that we used to see in the New Testament or that we see in the book of Acts? And, and, and there's all kinds of people that have opinions about that. And many times it comes in the form of an indictment against the church today and that we don't have the faith that they had or we're not filled with the Holy Spirit like they are, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I would say this, that I believe that we currently have God's revealed word of God available to us now, that we are called upon to preach the word of God and that the power of the testimony of God's people is the transformation of people's lives. Greatest miracle that there is, is a person moving from death to life spiritually, greater than any other kind of miracle. But having said that, when the gospel penetrates new regions of the world, I believe very much, particularly in places where the, there is no testimony of Christ, that the messengers and the messages are authenticated by signs and wonders and miracles. And so to answer your question, there are signs, wonders, and miracles that are, are, that are taking place today throughout the world as the gospel penetrates new areas. Once it's established in a specific area, so many times we see those falling off in terms of the numbers of signs and wonders. And the reason being, I believe, is because that message has already taken root in that particular culture. I think it's a good explanation for what we're going to see in the book of Acts in weeks ahead. Uh, these miracles, and by the way, the greatest miracles today is the transformation of a life. People get, and we're, we're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead as we move through this uh, series. Third, we see that the church will grow, okay? And, and so how does it grow? In verse 44, we see in togetherness. Look, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Now, a, a number of weeks ago, Jeff talked about this idea of togetherness, this idea of fellowship that I've just talked about, and that is, is that, that we need one another. And uh, one of the dangers of this time that we're living in with the coronavirus and the, the mandatory isolation, you know, shelter at home and all of these other things, uh, is that there are some people that are actually enjoying it, embracing it, um, may never want to go back to the, 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 to quote, togetherness again. Um, I would say there's a danger in that and, and be, be careful of that. Uh, we need each other. Uh, uh, our, our nature is such for some of you in particular that you tend to be a little bit more isolationist by nature. But the new nature that God gives us, uh, you need people. We need people. Be, be careful in this regard. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 
It says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. This verse has been quoted a lot on social media of late uh, for, quote, churches to get back together that we're, we're to meet again. Uh, again, we believe that meeting in, in uh, environments like our homes right now is most appropriate. We're beginning a reentry plan, again, being very aware and cautious in that, that procedure. Uh, the principle that's here, the principle that's here is, is what's critical for us to understand, and that is, is that we need people, and that isolation and being alone can be very dangerous to us. In fact, a story is told of D.L. Moody, who had a conversation with a man that, uh, that came to Christ, uh, D.L. Moody being a great evangelist. He came to Christ, and he's having a conversation. He says, you know, I love Jesus, and, and I know I need him, but I don't think I need to go to church to be a Christian. I think that being a Christian is great, but I don't really feel like I need the church. To which D.L. Moody didn't say anything. He literally got up from the conversation, walked over to the fireplace, grabbed some tongs, took, a, took an ember out of the fireplace, pulled it out of the fireplace, place and put it on the hearth and literally stood there and just watched it in utter silence not saying a word and the man watched it as well as it burned out and the man said I understand you know you um, you can't exist alone for very long without burning out and uh, I think that's the important of this concept of togetherness Verse 45, it says that they cared in their care for one another as well. The church will grow in togetherness and in care for each other. Verse 45, they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. Uh, they exercised hospitality, obviously around the kitchen table, but also generosity, giving up their own possessions for their new family, the family of God. God's family is to be generous. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> these, this passage of scripture has been used by some for, for socialism, uh, concepts, co uh, communism, or communalism, uh, you know, living in communes and those kinds of things. And, and I just want to say this, that there are some major differences. Uh, this sharing was voluntary, not forced. The difference between, say, Christianity and communism, communism says this, all that's yours is mine. Christianity says this, all that's mine is yours. Uh, they gave and they distributed things as the need arose. It wasn't as if everybody had everything equally. It wasn't all the same. It wasn't a distribution so that everybody had exactly the same amount. No, it's as people had needs, they made distribution. And it came from a, a love and it came uh, out of a compassion. Jesus said, given it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured out into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Luke 6, 38. We are called by Jesus and through the example of the apostles and this early church to share and to care for one another. It's God's plan. Later, we're going to see in Acts chapter 4 that the congregation, they were of one heart, it says in verse 32. Uh, not one of them claimed anything belonging to them. In other words, there was a transfer of ownership that took place at conversion. They recognized that God owns everything that I have. And that, so we literally, it's a, it's a principle as we mature in Christ that we sign the title deed of our life over and, and literally our possessions as well. Everything I have is from God. God, how do you want me to use my life? How do you want me to use my possessions? Uh, and then in verse 35, it goes on and says this, and they distributed each as they had need. Again, it was need-based. You know, um, It's not this idea that there was some sort of utopian society that was established. By the way, just a side note, historically, Atascadero was founded as a city based upon an, a utopian principle. And what's fascinating to me is that some of the things that are transpiring today, people are trying to remake America with this concept of this utopian society, uh, a naive belief somehow that we don't need adequate policing and those kinds of things, that oh, why can't we just all get along and love one another and, and all. Uh, what it misunderstands and what utopian society people misunderstand is that there is a sin nature in humanity. 
and that literally government is called to restrain the, the sin nature of humanity. And we are called upon to, therefore, acknowledge our sin. We're called to repent from our sin and be baptized to be transformed in the image of Christ. That has always been the message of the church. That will always be the message of the church. We call people to acknowledge their sin and to repent from it and, and move in a new direction. Uh, these people were aware of the fact that people had needs, they cared about other people with needs, and they met the needs voluntarily. Okay. Third, we see this celebration. You know, God grows his church through celebration. It says in verse 46, And day by day continued with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, as I had already mentioned. They were taking their meals together, and what does it say? With gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. Uh, at this point, by the way, they were still meeting in the temple. They weren't kicked out of the temple yet. They're going to get kicked out of the temple. This was a new movement, you know. Eventually, they're going to get kicked out of the, the temple, which, uh, which <laughs> is interesting because, you know, in a sense, we kind of got kicked out of church, right? So there is this sense. And so what did they do when they got kicked out of the temple? They went to the home church. What did we do when we got kicked out of the church, in a sense? We went to home churches. The church is still the church, meeting in homes. You are still the church. We are still the church. We are still meeting. We just don't get to meet in that building, you know. But now, he, he says, as these guys were, were together, what were they doing? There was gladness, praising God, favor. There was this joy. And, and, and I got to say that, that, that this expression of gladness, praising God, what we would call worship, as we worship the Lord together, um, that, that's one of the greatest benefits of being together, is the ability to, to, to worship together. And man, that night that we had on Sunday night a few weeks ago when we were out there in the country and, and, and just to be together again and to be able to worship, uh, it was like water for a thirsty soul for so many of us that got to enjoy that uh, God knows we need that, you know. There, there's so many neat ingredients in terms of, of, of the church when it's functioning correctly. There's this oneness, there's this gladness, there's this unity. Uh, I love the story of, of uh, the kindergarten class that was asked to bring the symbols of their faith and uh, <laughs> for show and tell. Remember that, show and tell? I don't know if they still do that. But uh, so the, the teacher said, bring, bring a, a symbol of your faith. And so a Muslim child brought a prayer rug and said, I'm a Muslim and, and this is my prayer rug. And a Jewish little boy said, I'm Jewish and this is the Star of David. A Catholic little boy said, I'm Catholic and this is my rosary. And a Christian little boy said, I'm Christian and this is a casserole dish. Now, for some of you, you might not even know what a casserole dish is, but I'm telling you what, man, when I grew up, it was potlucks, you know, and we would go to church and we'd go to church functions and there was potlucks and there was casseroles everywhere. I don't know whoever invented the casserole. I don't have a lot of positive things to say about it, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, when we share food together, something special happens and I still have delightful memories, even as a child of the times that we would gather together with the church of God. There's something very special about God's people who like each other, that spend time together, that eat together. Again, God does some great work around the kitchen table. And finally, we see this, that they grew numerically. Verse 47, and the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. You know, we learn three things from verse 47. The Lord is the one who adds the numbers to the church or adds people to the church. The Lord added to their numbers and not just their spiritual growth. And the Lord adds those who are being saved. God's intention for the church is to grow. God wants numerical growth in the church. And a healthy church is a church that continues to grow and continues to add people to the church who are being saved. One of the great calls and challenges of churches, especially well-established churches like ours, is that we lose our heart for the lost. And that we don't, but that we're content with the numbers that we currently have. Man, that we would never be content. God's heart is for the lost. Our heart must be for the lost. One of the exciting things about the new strategies that, that we're feeling like with the home church is the opportunity for regional 
gatherings to be able to invite neighbors to a setting that that's probably less threatening or certainly less threatening than than coming to church may never come to church but would possibly come to a home we believe that god can really use this to to bring people to himself even in this time of social distancing and all the challenges and all the unrest that's here that this is a great opportunity for us for a church god's heart is for the lost our heart must be for the lost as well and a church that is a healthy church is a church that adds to their numbers as well. I love this passage of scripture. It has so much uh, in it. Um, you know, bottom line is that church is a family. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you're a part of that family. And the way that the family demonstrates to the world that, that we're his is the fact that, that there's a togetherness. There's a togetherness, there's a unity, there's a love, there's a camaraderie. This is the model for the church, and this is the model that we need to live out. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this amazing birth of the church that we have witnessed and talked about today. I thank you for uh, our church. Uh, God, I thank you for the opportunities, God, that you're giving us. And Lord, as we have had this season to kind of examine what we do and why we do it and how we do it, Lord, I pray that this might be a refining time for all of us and that, Lord, we might uh, long for what you long for, and that is the church of Christ, God, to grow. And Lord, for us to be a part of that and that, Lord, we might lean in to relationships, uh, that we need the fellowship, uh, that we're all in the same boat together and that, Lord, we, we need to care for one another in, in a positive way. I just, I just thank you for every person that's listening right now. And God, just ask you to give us even a greater love for, for the things that you love, including your church. And so we just commit ourselves, Lord, to that end. And Lord, for any who have yet to proclaim you as their Savior, that it's the gospel. The gospel is the only hope for the world today. It is our message in these times. It's the message not only for our society, but for every individual, that they might respond to the gift of salvation that is through Christ and Christ alone, through acknowledging their own sin and repenting from it and following you and being baptized and joining the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for that truth. We continue to proclaim Christ and him crucified and resurrected from the dead. It's in his powerful name that we pray. Amen. All I want is more of you. So come and do what you want to do. Spirit, come open up my heart to you. Come and say what you want to. All I want is more of you. You're my vision in the darkest days. Forever, Jesus, you remain. I want to know your heart, Lord. I want to hear your voice. Take all of my attention, speak over all the noise. There's nowhere I'd rather be, Lord, nothing I'd rather do. Oh, just to know your presence, oh, just to be with you.
your heart, Lord. I want to hear your voice. Take all of my attention. Speak over all the noise. There's nowhere I'd rather be, Lord. Nothing I'd rather do. Oh, just to know your presence. Oh, just to be with you. Just to be with you. Just to be with you, Jesus. So as we have opportunity to kind of talk about um, the message today, uh, it, we began with the, the, the church being devoted to the apostles' teaching. Um, I would just ask you to, to maybe go around the group and ask the question, do you have a, a time with the Lord? What we would consider a devotional time. Do you have that time individually? It's kind of a yes, I do or no, and 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 all. And if you don't, I know it's awkward because like, well, I don't really, or it's not very consistent. I just want to say that's okay for you to say that. Hopefully, it's safe enough in the group that you're in to be able to say that. Let's just be honest with each other. But do you want to? And if you do want to, then say that. Say, you know, I I'm not really uh, at a level that I'd like to be at, but I'd like to do that. If you verbalize that and then tell people when and where you're going to do that, uh, accountability is an amazing thing. Uh, you'll be surprised how that will motivate you to get started. And I don't think you'll ever regret the fact that you started, okay? Um, in terms of fellowship, the concept, we talked about it a lot. How has this season of social distancing impacted your sense of need for fellowship? Um, maybe have a conversation uh, about that. Um, as it relates to fellowship, is the kitchen table ministry something that you feel like God's calling you to? Uh, and how might you improve uh, in that ministry of the kitchen table ministry? And uh, finally, I would challenge you to go around the group and ask for one thing that you can pray for, for somebody else, every person in the group, one thing, this week and then the group just agree to say we're going to pray for that one thing every day for a week write it down two options write it on a piece of paper uh or uh write put it in your phone as a reminder and just just try it for a week and then next week report back on on how that went uh, just to be able to pray for each other every day all week is very very powerful and does a lot for bringing people together in terms of making them feel more like a family and, and that's what we are. Church is a family. Uh, have a great week. Uh, great to be with you again. Glad you, you tuned in to us today. God bless you. Slave to sin, Jesus died.